a podcast of 98FM's Dublin Talks. Remember, catch the show live Monday to Friday at 10 a.m. 98FM's Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy. We'll be speaking to a football club who are desperately trying to raise funds after their clubhouse was destroyed by vandals over the weekend. Sally Nogan Pierce Football Club have started a GoFundMe page after their equipment and team kits were set on fire by vandals. They kicked a hole in the clubhouse to get in and get access to the equipment. A similar incident happened only a week ago at Carrig Lee Football Club in Monkstown. And what we want to know on the show uh, today is should there be harsher punishments for acts like antisocial behaviour like this? Uh, in a couple of minutes, I'll be talking to a Sinn Féin councillor who made the headlines last week for saying that one of the solutions to combating antisocial behaviour is to penalise the parents of children who commit antisocial behaviour. And I'm going to come back and talk to that, uh, about that in a couple of minutes. And I'd love to hear from you. You can text WhatsApp or send a WhatsApp voice note to 87 987 Let's find out what happened at uh, Sally Noggin Pierce uh, Football Club. And I'm joined on the line by the treasurer of the club, uh, George Downer. George, welcome to 98FM. Hey, good morning. How are you, sir? Good, thank you. George, what happened here? Oh, shocking, absolutely shocking. Um, so yesterday morning, we had a match at 11 o'clock yesterday morning and we meet at half nine, so um, we all met at half nine at the clubhouse and as we uh, assembled there, we noticed a, a fire beside the clubhouse. Not that unusual, there's a fire um, set there, but the closer we got, obviously we seen a big hole in the side of the dressing room where they'd broken into the, basically kicked through some concrete and corrugated iron. Um, our clubhouse is lovely known as the tin can at the it's it's not in great nick, but um, I, I'll, I'll try to keep the language um, okay here. But um, it's our clubhouse, you know. Mm. It's, a, it's a great it's a clubhouse where the great Paul McGrath once played in and trained. Um, and the more we looked, the more we realised that they weren't. Uh, so we first noticed the benches where we all sit down and get changed, all gone. Then we noticed all our training gear gone, from cones to bibs to um, shuttles and everything that would be associated with football training. Um, oh, gone or, or or just destroyed? Sorry, gone, as in on the fire, burned. Oh, sorry, right, okay, yeah. Um, we've got two teams, a Saturday and a Sunday team. Obviously, we had a Sunday team meeting yesterday, and we had just got um, two brand new sets of gear um, sponsored by uh, by George down in the Salinogan Inn. Great brand new set of gear. Our Saturday team wore it um, on the previous day and had left it in the clubhouse for me to, to collect to, to bring it to the laundrette, and uh, we noticed that that was gone. So, a brand new set of gear. Also, the second second um, change of gear as well, gone. When I say gone, I mean burned on the fire. Um, so this was a half nine, quarter to ten yesterday morning. As you can imagine, we were running around trying to organise a match. We had playing um, Clondalk and Celtic, who also would like to uh, give them a mention as well. They were great before the game. If we needed any balls or bibs or nets or whatever. Um, and... Uh, and that's that's the story. That that's what that's what happened yesterday. So they broke in, wrecked the yeah. place, and burned mm. everything. Burned everything. Now you remember Saturday night? Adrian, it was a horrible little night. Yeah, it was. Yeah. These guys and we we we, we actually found out obviously our own detective work who they are. We kind of know bit by bit who they are. Would you believe there's photographs of them outside the clubhouse on social media? And this is what you're dealing with. They, they go to the Sorry, local say, say, say that again, George. There's photographs yeah. of them there's outside. Photographs the... of them of these kids. Outside the clubhouse on Saturday. Outside the clubhouse on Saturday night. Yeah, unfortunately, that's who, that's what they're dealing with. A lot of these kids have gone to the same school that, that I actually went to. Um, so we approached their principal there this morning. Obviously, the Gardaí have been involved, um, but it's just a kick in the you know what. It's, it's, it's it ripped the heart and soul out of us. We, we're, we're we're in the process of trying to fund um, a new clubhouse, um, and it's not just a football clubhouse. It's a, it's going to be a community room for the whole of the Sally Nogman. And, uh, and the surrounding areas, um, there's going to be boxing clubs and martial arts, there's going to be uh, girl guides and all of this and everything else that goes to the community room. So we're trying to get this up and running. And the council have been great in giving us a plot of land for that um, across the road from where these existing, existing dress rooms are. But at the moment, we've nowhere to train, and, sorry, nowhere to change. We can't leave any of the gear there because they'll, they'll probably break in again tonight and rob whatever's 
left, if there's anything left. Um, but I'd just like to big thank you to the whole community out there because the um, so the GoFundMe page has been set up. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm just do. looking at it as, uh, as I'm yeah. talking to you, George, and I see that so far uh, you've raised €1,742 wow. Euro of a €2,000 target, which is amazing. That's amazing. Um, a big thank you. And, I, and I'm looking there. I had a quick look earlier on. Now, I wasn't aware of that figure, but like, people donating €5 Euros and €10. Euros, and I know personally that these, some of these people they haven't got two red cents to run mm. together, but they're putting a fiver, and these little fivers... They just add up to this. And what we're trying to get is just get our training gear. Like we've had a, a crowd, a marketing crowd, be different marketing on there, offering us all this training gear. Um, we've also had our own sponsors as well, being on to us, looking to help us out. Which is fantastic well, and, uh, and, yeah. and brilliant that people are rallying behind us. And as I said, um, looking at the, the GoFundMe, and I'll give you the details of the GoFundMe page in a second, uh, you shouldn't have to be doing this. This is the sad part of this whole story. Um, and the, the sadder part is that the gobshites who did it actually put themselves on social media at the site, which is just bizarre. At the site, it's so absolutely it, crazy. George, what, what is they- something, what are the guards saying? Is somebody going to be done for this? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Gardaí. We rang the Gardaí yesterday morning when we first announced, and they were down within 10 or 15 minutes, and two young Gardaí, and they were shocked and just nodding their head. They took hmm. details. But what, what can they do? There is no law. These, these are kids. So what will happen? I don't know. In fact, I, like as, as you may have heard in my introduction, a conversation I'm going to lead on to in a second is yeah. whether or not, and this is a, a, a councillor made the headlines last week for saying that one of the solutions to combating this type of antisocial behaviour is to actually penalise parents. Perfect. Yeah, well, that's what we're looking for here. Like, these are your kids. These have done this damage. There's, there's, there's probably about 12 of them in this photograph. Now, who actually physically kicked in? To break into, into this dressing room, right? it's not like a couple of kicks and you're in. This is, the, the bottom part is concrete, the top part is corrugated iron. It takes like, a lot of time to do what they did. Mm. This was not like something done in five minutes. This is not one person on his own. This is a group of lads. And there's girls in this photograph as well, which was even more shocking. And in my, in my opinion, all of these kids are to blame. Not one of those kids said, hang on a second here. My dad, my uncle, my brother, mm. my cousin plays in this football club. That's his gear. We've worked hard fundraising for this, for this, all this equipment. It must be very, very frustrating, George, to, you know, with all the work that goes into clubs like yours, to see all your hard work, all your sponsors' money literally burned in a heap on the ground uh, on Sunday morning. That must wreck your head. Well, Adrian, I'll be honest with you. Yesterday morning, I was as good as walking away from football. Mm. I was that because you just you, you just have to yeah you game. just have to think to yourself why do I bother why there is why, a, there's, why? A, there's a boundary I would have likened to think that these scumbags you don't cross yeah. it happened down in Carrick Lee they burnt they burnt, set a bonfire out in the middle of the pitch these are certain boundaries you don't cross in society and excuse my language but shitting on your own doorstep yeah. this is there's, there's nearly 50 lads involved in this club we're setting up an over 25 next year when the clubhouse is up and running we're looking to get kids back playing for peers you know, the, the old ways, just playing football, getting kids off the street. We've got kids, and there are, some, of, some of our members are kids, 17, 18, 19 years of age, training twice a week, playing a match on a Saturday or a Sunday. But these kids aren't involved with our club. They, who's to say, they're not going to be standing beside this bomb for, yep. but they're not. They're getting up off their arses and actually going to do something, yeah. And doing something for the community. In fact, in, in fact um, I'm going to be hearing about another football club, George, um, straight after the break uh, from yeah. Swords on the north side who have experienced the exact same thing, which is just shocking, uh, shocking is right. Um, George, your, uh, let me just get it up here. Your um, GoFundMe page is live now. And as I said, you've uh, so far raised €1,742. And if any of our listeners can afford even a fiver, um, it will be much appreciated. All you do is go to GoFundMe.com and search for Sally Noggin Pierce FC and uh, you can donate a fiver if you can afford to donate and a just, fiver. Just on that, it is, and the, the community and the, the wider field have been amazing. Anything else extra that we do raise will we'll be going to a charity, um, a local charity. Um, we'll have a, a meeting tonight with the community. Only, when I say the community, there's, there's four or five lads that you know, we don't sit down a proper committee as such. But we'll sit down tonight and discuss what we'll do with the funds and we'll, we'll make 
what funds we do donate um, available on social media and whatever else. So everything does count, a fiver, tenors, anything you have. Um, and also as well, if you want to come down and play football, Mondays and Wednesday nights, we play at Saturday and Sunday with two teams there. Um, two really good teams. Saturday team are flying at the moment. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, Clendalk and yesterday, they were generous in their office, but they weren't very generous in the football field yesterday. They beat us 3-1, but sure, that's, that's, that's life. That's, that's another <laughs> issue. <laughs> Indeed it is. Well, as I'm talking to you, uh, I am donating a tenor here as well, uh, myself, okay? So um, once again, you go to GoFundMe.com and you search for Sally Noggin um, FC and you can donate even a fiver if you can afford a fiver. You're very good. And I've just given a tenor there, so there you go. And so. you can keep up the good work for, for what you do for the city and the, and the local community as well. The, the, Thank, the show, the show thanks very much indeed, George. Yeah, Appreciate that. God good to you. talk to you. And, and hopefully we'll talk the next time in, uh, in better circumstances. In a moment, I'm going to be talking to a councillor who believes it is time that we started penalising the parents of children who commit antisocial behaviour in order that they start bringing them under control. John sent me this WhatsApp voice note. I do understand it to be far, that's the best thing to do with them. Find the parents, and I bet you were in a year, a year and a half, it'll decrease by about 70%. Because if anybody's, if anybody's given out about it, if they know that kids are out doing nothing, why would you be against it? Do you know what I mean? It's only the kids that are out running and mucking, and their parents that are going to be fined. So why would anybody else care? If you know what your kids are doing, your kids are good kids and they're not doing it, then let the ones that are out doing it get fined. Okay, and I would argue with you, John, yeah, and find the parents, but... Can you really know where your kids are 24-7? Especially when they're teenagers and they're, you know, 15, 16. How in God's name are you meant to know where they are all day, every day? Uh, Kira also says uh, parents should be fined. Good morning, Adrian. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think the parents should be penalised when the kids are out vandalising our football clubs and anything else that goes along with it. Um, I know that sounds a bit tough, but life is tough. And if these little vandals had any moral compass towards their parents that put a roof over their head and clothes on their bodies, they would uh, not do what they're doing. So I, I definitely think that uh, the parents should be should be penalised and anyone that doesn't have kids that are little, you know what's going around doing this, then they don't have to worry. So such as myself, it's not something that my family would ever have to worry about. So I definitely agree. Penalised parents. Okay, I'd like to hear from you. Text WhatsApp or send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 98 98 98. Uh, James is from uh, Swords Manor Football Club. And uh, James, something similar to uh, what happened in Sally Noggin almost happened at your club over the weekend. Yeah, that's right. Um, last night we got a call from the security guard in local Sparsh, um saying that uh, there was lads over there trying to break into the, into the new clubhouse. Now, the council gave us a new clubhouse recently after years of the club trying to have nothing actually, no facilities whatsoever. We've had containers like every other club in the country. Mm. And um, last night they were trying to break into it. Now, there's a steel cage door over the actual door frame itself. And now they had a we have holes and screwdriver that. So you can see the chips being taken out of the lock and in around the cage itself. But he tried it twice last night. Not once, twice to get into it. And there's nothing in it yet. We don't have anything in it yet. Oh, really? So they're breaking into nothing? Yeah. They're breaking into nothing. Uh, and we know who ser- it is. Ser- the right. can't do anything about it. That is very frustrating. Um, so now, that, obviously now you're, wor- got- you're, you're worried if you do put anything into it, it is going to be broken into. Oh, of course. Well, we, we're, going, we're in the process of the electricity being done, the water being done up now soon, and we're setting up security cameras as well around it. But as the guard said last night, that if we catch them on CCTV, then they can do something. But if we don't catch them, they can't do anything. Nope. A couple of members of the club chased them away last night, um, including our own chairman himself. Actually ran after the young lads last night down through a couple of houses safe as well, and he got away from them. But we know who they are. Same little co rags doing a week in, week out. Vandalizing the pitches, vandalizing hills. They were up there only a few weeks back, egging houses. And break the act. We actually got a new sign put up on the side of our clubhouse saying, Welcome to the Swords Manor Football Club with the crest and all on it. And he ripped it down. Oh, for God's sake. So, I mean, like it, <sighs> and I wouldn't mind, but some of these kids actually play for other clubs as well. Not in the area, but they play for clubs outside the area. But there's one, one little car right there that he's just, he's uncontrolled. And his parents don't have any control of him whatsoever. And he just does what he wants. 
And oh, uh, oh, as, with, as, with our, like, as with our friends in Sally Noggin, you, you heard, um, well, I don't know if you heard, you heard we were talking to um, the club and they, they kind of despair sometimes and feel like packing it all in. Look, we all feel like that, but well, unfortunately, the fact that with every club, you have to keep your head up and go again. I know, like, it is hard as well. Like, we've had it, I think we've had it a couple of years back where a container was born. Actually, it's right, there was a hole in the roof and he born the container. So we had all the equipment that was inside it. So this is going back a few years back now. But since then, we've, like, we're doing our best up in the club. And we are a community club, like every other club in, in the area as well. But we have these little power rags up and down every weekend just vandalising the entire area and there's nothing to be done about it. And guys, unless they actually have physical proof, evidence, photographs or a video CCTV of them, we can't do anything about it. Well, with every other club as well, we also have the problem with motorbikes as well, going up and down on the pitch as well. Which is another day, another day's work. But when they're actually, yeah. you know, when when I hear of the this Sally Noggin story of them literally setting all their kits, all their bibs, all their cones, everything on on a bloody bonfire, I just yeah, I, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It, it is ridiculous. It is. Because, like every club works hard to make sure that they're in the right condition. Like every club has to make sure that they're in the right condition. Like we don't get much fun, we do a lot, of, like a lot, of, a lot of fun, and we we do with fundraising and. We get a couple of grants now and again here and there as well. We don't get much out of grants, but we have enough to keep us going with our own. And, and, and every club is the exact same. So, I mean, we tend to have to, most of the clubs have their own stuff. We try and keep them in their own house as well. But we have containers there, facilities there. We try and keep them there, but what's the point? They'll only end up getting destroyed. Absolutely, it really is very, very frustrating. And what, what do you think, because this is a conversation we're going to have, uh, James, about whether or not we should look at, and, and something has been talked about for a long time. But, be yes, that's, you believe that without, as well? Without a doubt, yeah, without a doubt. And I'm sure, we'll have, sure you will have a lot of callers accepting the exact same thing. Well, the only ones I won't accept would be the parents that we know their kids are actually doing this thing. All right, well, let's, let's have that conversation now. Thanks, James, uh, because last week a Sinn Féin councillor called Aidan Mullins made the headlines for saying that one of the solutions to combating this type of antisocial behaviour is uh, to penalise parents. And um, uh, councillor Aidan Mullins joins me on the line. Uh, Aidan, welcome to 98FM. Thanks very much. Aidan, what made you speak out about this and, and suggest that for once and for all it's time we find parents? Well, I have to say, since being elected over five years ago, I could see, only then I began to see firsthand the devastating effects that antisocial behaviour is having. And a lot of this is, is a step above what we normally would consider to be antisocial behaviour. And we're talking about criminal activity and criminal damage and uh, other levels of, of uh, behaviour. But... Um, as I said, since being elected and having been speaking to people who are directly affected, you've been the volunteers with clubs and mm. the facilities being damaged. But there's another aspect to it as well, in, in, mostly in housing estates, where people are being intimidated, threatened, their lives are miserable. They can be made hell by this type of activity. And it seemed to me that the state agencies don't seem to have a coordinated approach. They don't seem to address it sufficiently. And there's a sort of a stand back attitude that uh, it'll go away or it'll sort itself out. But when I see people selling up their homes, when I see others unable to sell because they're in negative equity, but want to the areas, when I see children afraid to leave the house in the morning to go on a school bus, they're afraid to cross the green area in the estate, and you've got parents who are afraid to work themselves from threats and intimidation. And the suggestion that parents be held responsible, that's not going to be a silver bullet here. But I just think it should be one strand of a multifaceted approach to the whole problem. And I think it won't solve every problem. I think in some instances it could address it. OK, so, um, I mean, the theory is, uh, by fining parents, you're putting the, the onus on them to sort their bloody brats out, really, is what this is about, isn't it? Well, I thought that was a given. Mm. I thought... Oh, the children... parents would keep their, their kids under control, well, yeah. In an, I I, in an ideal world. That. Yeah, in an ideal yes. world, Aidan, yeah. 
And children here, we're talking about 12 to 18 year olds. Now, somebody just under 18 to me is not a child, but that's the definition of a child in, in the legislation. Mm. And we have um, certain um, mechanisms available to us, and one is the ASBO, the Antisocial Behaviour Order. Uh, which came out in the Criminal Justice Act for uh, the section for children in 2006. I'm not sure if that's been utilised. I'm not sure if it's been implemented. Is it... Uh, no, I mean, no, the, the reality of it is we were talking about a football club um, destroyed in Saturday Noggin at the weekend. The idiots who actually did it have themselves on social media at the clubhouse. They've identified themselves and the chances are, Aidan, they will get away with it. Well, then you're talking about the criminal justice system not working properly because you've got uh, the Gardaí, if, it, if it's a criminal offence, obviously it's the Gardaí should address it. Mm. And for young people, we've got the juvenile diversion programmes. We've got, um, we have mechanisms there to deal with them. It doesn't solve the problem for everybody, but the juvenile liaison officer there, they should be sitting down with these guys, see, can they change the behaviour in the first instance? Sometimes it does work, not all the time, obviously. And... It's not fair to, to blame all the parents either because and the kids, some of them come from dysfunctional homes and there can be alcohol, substance abuse issues, there could be mental health issues. So there's a number of things come into play here. But the Department of Health, the HSE, the justice system, the Gardaí, the local authorities, I think all have a role to play. But I don't think there's any joined up thinking here. Mm. OK, so one of the suggestions is, as far as you're concerned, to literally hit parents of teenagers who are committing antisocial behaviour, literally hit them in the pocket and start making, forcing them to deal with the issue of, their, of the behaviour of their children. Absolutely. And as, even at the moment, if you look at the ASBOs, it can be linked into that. And mm. there is a provision there to, to go to court and to find. And, but the, the past the proceedings and the fine cannot be more than €1,500. Euro. But I don't have any data. Was that ever implemented? Was anybody ever fined through the ASBO system? I don't know that. Mm. I know that there's, there's over 1,300 ASBOs issued in 2017, I believe. But then, will the fine be collected? So The reality that, of it is, though, I mean, if you're talking about a figure of 1,300 uh, ASBOs, <laughs> there are... 13 million, well, maybe not 13 million, yes. but, uh, you know, 130,000 incidents of antisocial behaviour, not 1,300. And that yes. proves, actually, that figure that you've just given me proves to me that teenagers committing antisocial behaviour are getting away scot-free. Absolutely. And the Alvaro system here was based on a similar scheme in the UK at the time. But in the UK, they've since scrapped that. They've abandoned it, yeah. Mm, They've yeah. abandoned it and have introduced other measures like injunctions and criminal behaviour orders. But I, I do believe in certain instances that the, the parents should have attachment orders to wages or to their social welfare payment. And I don't, I don't listen to the argument they can't afford it. That doesn't wash with me at all. Mm. All right, Aidan Mullins is a Sinn Féin councillor. Thanks very much indeed, Aidan. I'd like to hear from you on 67979081. Adrienne um, is experiencing antisocial behaviour where she lives. Adrienne, I live in Kilimana and the council put up uh, a new fence last week around the playground. The first night they took half the fence away, the vandals, and the second night they finished it off. So it's open plan now, which, which is very dangerous. Call me right now on 67979081. We'll take some of your calls straight after the break. 98FM's Dublin Talks with Quotevil.ie. Car and van insurance specialists for drivers with previous motoring convictions. 98FM. And good morning from Adrian Kennedy. We're talking about whether or not it is possible or doable or practical to fine parents if their teenagers are involved in antisocial behaviour. We heard about Sally Noggin Pierce Football Club, uh, which was broken into, ransacked, and all of their gear set on fire. Just, it's so mindless, it's frustrating, it really is. Anyway, these gobshites even videoed themselves uh, on social media. So <laughs> the guards know who they are, the club know who they are, and um, nothing is going to happen to them. Carol uh, is in Tala. You're on 98FM, Carol. How are you? Hi, how are you? Is it practical to start finding parents? Yeah, totally. And what do you think that will do? Will it stop the antisocial behaviour? 
at the end of the day, it's what you teach your kids. If I thought my, and I have three kids, my eldest is going to be 17 in November. And if he ever, ever thought of doing that, he would be punished. And I, I, I'd be punished in what way? What, what could you do? Realistically, uh, Carol. What could I do? Yeah. Make him go back to where he vandalised, clean it up, yeah. and he, he'll learn his lesson. No. I don't know what your young fella's like, but I know what some young fellas are like. And uh, he turns around at 15 or 16 or 17 and says, piss off, man, I'm not doing that. Yeah, well, believe me, I drag him out of bed. And I've had to do. Okay? There's things. And seriously, no, I, I, I just don't agree. And people are going to say... Oh, there's nothing for them to do in the area. No, 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 that's just... right. In fact, there is something for them to do in the area. That football club. <laughs> <It's>... Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And they've just ruined it because no parent is looking out. And I'm sorry, I will be the one. I will make my sure any of my kids, as I said, I had three, will go out. If they ever did anything like that, they will go and clean up the mess they made. Simple as. And I... Yes, yeah, simple as, and I'll be the first one there. Okay, them. but but stay there for one second, Carol. So, so what? A parent. So, say for example, the young fellas mm-hmm. involved in the destruction of the the football club in Sally Noggin. Okay, let's. Uh, as I said, they've identified themselves in social media. They're that thick. But um, yeah. should uh, how much of a fine would you give their parents? I'm not saying you give them a huge fine, but you you have to say that it has to be done. Like, you have to make... Okay, are we talking about 100 quid or...? No, replace some of the stuff they've damaged. Like, these kids that are going to do their football or whatever it is they Mm -hmm. do every week, you have to replace it. It shouldn't be on the club to replace it. These parents should club together and say, right, we'll replace some of the gear. That's it. All right, stay there for one second, Carol. Six seven nine seven ninety eight one is our telephone number. But sorry, Carol, just back to the mm-hmm. point. How much? You, let's say it's not necessarily a destruction of property, but it's 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 causing antisocial behaviour. What sort of fine would you uh, impose? Is it a hundred euro? Is it a thousand euro? I think they should uh, replace what was destroyed. Okay, let me go to Martin. You're on ninety eight FM. How are you, Martin? Well, I was going. Good, thank you, Martin. Um, your point on this is how, how or who's going to pay the fine? Well, no, I, I was just saying to the girl earlier on, like she was saying about the what they did for the fine. The, the fine isn't going to do one. Why? Because they just won't pay because it. The parent is just going to pay the fine. Like the child, the child ain't learning. Do you know what I'm saying? The child is learning that from it. Yeah, but they well, they might um, because the parents are going to put much more pressure on them. They don't want to be getting fines. Um, but more, most of these kids. Uh, don't give a bollocks, like, they don't care. You know what I'm saying? They might care, for example... If they were, reared, fact, if they were reared properly in the first test, they wouldn't be out. They okay, be out uh, let me give you an example of a, a way in which they might care, OK? Um, let's imagine they... OK, so we're talking about children, so the parents are in receipt of children's allowance, OK? If yes. you... Uh, if your child is involved in antisocial behaviour, you have your children's allowance cut in half. That would soon teach you a lesson. To keep that's, control over your kids. That's not like, but that's uh, that's why they don't care. Like, you know, most of these children that don't care, it's monkey. Do you know what I mean? They're they're, they're looking at this happening. There's a lack of parenting. Like, oh, I know, obvi- obviously, obviously, yeah, yeah, but I, I agree with you, Martin. It's a lack of parenting or a lack of uh, control over where their kids are going or whatever the case may be. And in some cases, I will argue with you, Martin. Some parents don't know that their kids are up to no good. Yeah, that's, that's fair. That's okay? fair and maybe if those parents who don't know were to get a fine of €1,000 or have their children's allowance cut or whatever, they would soon start controlling where they're going. Um, and uh, a lot of people think you can't control them, but you, you can. You reckon, Karen, you can control teenagers if you set your mind to it. Yeah, you can. I've done it myself. I, as I said, I have three kids. My eldest will be 17 in November and he's gone through a lot and he's actually turned around and he knows if he does anything like that, he will be punished. Okay, stay there for a second. Uh, De- Dean, you're on 98 FM. How are you, Dean? Not bad. Uh, how are you? Now, you work for uh, a different club as a, car- 
Oh, you play for another club? No, Carrie. I play for another club. Yeah, okay. just down the road from Pierce. That's Carrie Glee, is that right? Yeah, Carrie Glee, best club around the borough. <laughs> and I believe that um, that was a tax as well. Uh, no, it wasn't a tax. Like, years ago, we had a problem with that. But um, it's a thing with Sally and Pierce. They had like a little clubhouse and it was handy, but it was like an old barn from the 1800s, you know? Uh, it was just metal. It wasn't brick. It wasn't a proper building, you know? Yes. So, like... If someone did something like the government, instead of funding big clubs like St. Joseph's Boys, the Cabo, Cabin Healy, they could have a proper facility, like the brick buildings, and none of this would have happened, you know? Mm. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, it, uh, by all accounts, it took an awful lot of effort anyway to do what they did. You know, it... uh, come here, to be honest, it wouldn't have been that hard for them to get into that. They'd been out straight. You know, and uh, the thing with parents being fine, yeah, fine parents, about 10%, 20% of the kids We'll probably get their act together, but still, when they leave at their house door, they're going back out to do more stuff, you know? In fact, somebody, and, somebody, a couple of people are actually after getting on to us uh, to tell us, and I despair when I hear this, uh, to tell us that most of those involved in the destruction of uh, Sally Nog and Pierce were over 18. They're not even kids. Yeah. Uh, oh. the, the, the generation at this day are oh, going man, and mad in the head. I mean, what idiots. I was mad in the head, but these are mad, mad in the head. You know what I mean? These, but were you, were the, you mad in the head, uh, Dean? Would you have done something like that? Uh, like, Set fire to... Wrong, my, mother, my mother raised us so well, you know what I mean? But I was a bit of a lunatic when I was a kid. Like but l- lunatic enough that you'd set fire to all the gear in the clubhouse and b- break well, into no, and smash it up? Well, but I was a little pyromaniac when I was like a teenager. No, I didn't say... Fucking, sorry for the language. I wouldn't set fire to a whole building, you know what I mean? I think that I was too afraid to confront my man if I got caught, you know? But I would set fire to things, like... And I'd blow it, like, an aerosol can. I'd, I'd spray it and put a lighter to it. No, I was a little mad child. Mm. I'm okay now, don't get me wrong. But <laughs> just this generation are kind of... They're just a bit more mental. As, uh, um, yeah, but as somebody said earlier on, uh, I always thought, you know, even if you're a tow rag, there are certain things you don't, just certain lines you don't cross. And setting fire yeah. to all of the, 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 the kits and gear from a football clubhouse, I would have thought is that step too far. Yeah, so, it is, because they, they're not funded, you know what I mean? No, that's, of course that's, not. That's their money. To, like, that's a good few hundred there, about thousand euro for all that gear, you know what I mean? And they can't whip that out of their back pockets just like that to get brand new stuff, you know what I mean? All right. Um, Lucas ten- uh, sent me this message, and um, uh, he sh- he says, uh, in other countries like Poland, uh, parents are responsible and have to pay for all damages caused by their children until they're 18. And that's really what where we need to be going here. We really do. Um, and Paul... Your point is that there is no accountability. If these guys were under 18, which I'm being told by a number of people that they're actually not, but anyhow, um, there, your, your point is there's no accountability. No, I think yeah, you have to look at it from a, there's a couple of points of view. Uh, I think we need more police, obviously, yeah. And and then and then the thing is, when, they, when the police catch these lads, it must be so disheartening for a policeman and, and I know a few the friends of mine. Once he's so determined to go and do all that work and then someone gets a suspended sentence or or, or nothing. Like, you, you're saying some of these lads are over 18. I can guarantee so, a lot of these have multiple offences. So if, if a 15-year-old is hanging around with a 19-year-old with multiple offences and sees that, you know what, actually nothing ever happens to these lads, what do you think is going to happen? Mm. Yeah, and no, I, only... I, I get the point. And, and when I heard earlier on that the year before last, 1,300 ASBO orders were issued, yeah, that's, that's nothing compared to the amount of actual antisocial behaviour that's going on. But see, I, I'm, I'm, I grew up in a different time and I'm from a big family. And I can tell you something. If someone came to my door and said that my, your son had broke this, that or the other, I probably wouldn't be here. Mm. And I, 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 I wasn't, that's not our fear. I had respect for my mum and dad because the thoughts of someone even knocking at my mum's door to say that I had done something... Would put the fear of God in you. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it was an unspoken thing. And I'm of the opinion, if you attack the elderly or a tourist or, or, if you take, or if you do something that's really beyond the pale, as they'd say, I think it should be just 10 years straight away. But you know that. Years. But you know that's not going to happen. We're much more likely to start but, fighting and, parents or making them and, pay. And the, the, the final point I'll make is: you only have to look at one of the biggest criminals in this country, 
okay, who is Frederick Thompson, is in prison and is actually taking the prison to court because his rights aren't being upheld. Are you taking the effing piss? Yeah. You don't have any rights. But that's the problem here. That yeah, is no, that is, a, that is the, pr- you, the problem. You that, actually, yeah. believe it or not, I'm a, you have more rights in this country if you're locked up than if you're lying asleep on the street at night. Now, how is that right? I agree with you, Paul. Thank you. 67979081 is our telephone number. Take a quick break and have a couple more calls to take uh, straight after the break. Don't go away. It's 11 o'clock across Dublin. This is Adrian Kennedy. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks. And this is Trish with Monday's Top Headlines. Thanks, Adrian. Campaigners are calling for the Environmental Protection Agency to launch an investigation into the destruction of wetlands in Talla. The area at Sean Walsh Park was home to thousands of creatures, including frogs, bats and eels. The area was flattened over the weekend and it's unclear who carried out the work. A new initiative is being launched today to encourage DART commuters to stagger their journeys. Peaktime.ie will help those with a bit of time flexibility to find quieter trains during rush hour. On average, 14,000 passengers travel on the DART in the AM compared to 10,000 in the evening. A football club in South Dublin says it's appalled by the destruction of their equipment and kits. The clubhouse of Sally Noggin Pierce was broken into over the weekend and thousands of euro worth of equipment was set alight. And Key West are to headline the whole coming for Dublin's footballers after the men's five and the women's three in a row victories. The celebrations get underway from half one in Marion Square on Sunday. And now you're up to date on 98. 98 FM's Dublin Talks. Call 67979081. This is Adrian Kennedy. Let's take um, a couple more calls on what we're talking about, which is, uh, you know, parents being held responsible for the antisocial behaviour of uh, their uh, young crowd. Uh, Jen sent us this message. I agree there with your last callers that they don't care. Um, and some parents will pay it out. Uh, it's not the children that's going to pay it. It's not going to come out of their pockets. I would think that something more like either they have to fundraise to replace the equipment um, and that they would have to go down and get and be involved in that club almost like a community service type of uh, consequence so that they physically have to experience either being humiliated or experiencing how to actually empathize and you know be sorry for their actions um, and see what they have actually impacted on um, I think that would be that might gain something more than just a cash buy Okay, thanks, Mel. Bye. Now, David, you say that the uh, the whole problem here is down to a lack of parenting. Totally, one hundred percent. Is this a new phenomenon? Um, parents are not forcing any boundaries on their children uh, because of the lack of fear of what will happen if they do step out of line. Um, the children are going out causing all this damage. But no fear for the repercussions if they get caught. I would argue with if, you, though, David, that we always had little toe rags. When I was a young fellow, we had little toe rags who were obviously afraid of the con- not afraid of the consequences either. For, I mean, if you change the consequences and the parents done their job, the children would have fear of this falling. Um, the fact is that the lack of parenting is, is what's at hand here. But has that, not always been, has that not always been the case, David, with certain young uh, youngsters, teenagers? There was always bad teenagers, when uh, you know, in any generation. So we've always had bad parenting then. Well, 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 there was, but not to the percentage of what is now. Right, OK, the, so... The whole, the, whole, the whole problem is the kids have no fear because they, they're taken away the fact that they can't be slapped anymore Mm -hmm. from the law, which is actually not the law. Uh, I spoke to a solicitor a few weeks ago. I drive a taxi in Dublin, and she was on a panel that wrote up this law. And it doesn't actually specify that you're not allowed to slap your kid. What does it say? that you're allowed... She told me, it says you're allowed to chastise your kid. Now, it doesn't directly say you can't slap your kid, but you can chastise them. That's all it says, is chastisement. There's no written rule of, of not being able to slap your kids. I have a 14-year-old daughter uh, who slapped her mother last year, and I slapped the arse off her. And she knows I'll do it again because she raised her hand to her mother. Oh. 
and I won't have that. T- t- tell me more about that. So, I mean, I, I myself and her mother are split up. Mm-hmm. I had her for a week, and I deliver her back to her mother's apartment, and she's clinging to me. So I give her another half an hour, and I said to her mother, i got to go to work. Um, I said, come on, take her, take her in. Um, and when she, her mother went to take her in, she turned around and slapped her across the arm and says, get your hands off. To which I brought her into the apartment and I slapped the arse off her. And I said, you'll never raise your hand to your parents. And how how old is she? She's 14 now. She's 14 now. Yes. Because I, I want to go back to what you were saying uh, about the law and yeah. the... It used to be a case, right, that um, yes. y- y- you could defend yourself in, I- I- if it ended up in court, that you were using reasonable chastisement, right? And that was the defence yes. of hitting a child. But that was removed yes. out of law back in 2015. Um, so that legal defence has been removed from the statute, meaning any such physical attack on a child uh, could now be punishable under the non-fatal offence against the Person Act. Okay. So, so it is. It, it, it is not allowed to hit children anymore by law. Well, this solicitor who was on that panel told me only a number of weeks ago that it wasn't the law. Now, unless something has changed, where what she's not connected to, maybe so. But I personally believe it's the parents' responsibility to know what their kids are doing. That's what the whole problem is here. Oh well, I don't know what my kid is doing, and they're writing it off. It, you know, he's stressed and all this stuff. But, uh, no, you see, have... but hang on, David. We were all devious when we were teenagers. And, uh, you know, your mammy might think you're in Johnny's house uh, having a sleepover or playing the Xbox and you're out destroying a football club. Mammy doesn't know that. How is mammy to well, know? Well, if mammy, uh, like the situation what happened in Sally Noggin and the, the, the pictures are being posted all over the place, I mean, there, there you go. The parents will see this somewhere on Facebook or one of those, but there's no responsibility being added to it from the parents. Okay, well, uh, okay, let's just go back to the um, uh, what you were saying about your, your daughter. And um, My blood is boiling here listening to that guy. When you hit a child, you, as an adult, have completely lost self-control. What do you say to that? Hey, okay. Uh, I was hit when I, when I was a child. Uh, it didn't do me any harm. Um, I'm a a reasonably good citizen. I was never in trouble with the police. The solicitor who wrote up that law, she was hit as a child, and it didn't do her any harm. We need boundaries, Adrian, to steer us through life. We know right from wrong. There's no point in not steering your children. But Uh, what, a wallop is the way of steering people, is it? Well... What, what else I mean, you, you follow that argument through and you get arrested by the guards for antisocial behaviour and what, they just kick the crap out of you? How, how the police kick the crap out of your kids? Is it, no, is that, it, I'm asking, is physical punishment the solution to these things? And it's not. It's not. Well, I mean, what, what is uh, I mean, the alternative? Take the money from the parents? Yeah. That, so that's only prolonging it. Okay, stay there for one second. And uh, one last call, very quickly. Orla, you're saying more or less the same thing, that parents and teachers are too soft on kids today. It's not that, Jeremy, if it, or Adrian. It, like, if a child thinks that their ma isn't going to correct them, they're going to go into that school and they're going to say, ma can't slap me anyway. Mm. So I'll go in and I'll treat the, che- the teachers wherever way I want, you know what? Look, it's like we- everyone's standing here. I'm young, the 12, we never bought the guards, we mother's all ever. Without any fear of repercussion. Uh, yeah, okay, so, uh, so a oh, lot of teenagers don't fear repercussion at all. If your child is running out on the road with the car, you know, slap the child on the hand. Don't do that again. Like, do you know what I mean? It's a kind of thing. They won't do it again. You know what I mean? You're not clattering the head off the child, like, around, baiting them off the fall wall. They're giving them a little slap on the hand or on the back of the bum. And I don't think you're doing us any harm. I know, and, uh, but uh, unfortunately... <laughs> It is not allowed. And, and you see, the argument against this, and this is a conversation maybe we'll have for, for another day. The argument against this is, um, let's imagine you commit a crime, OK? And uh, you get arrested and you get brought to the Garda station. If it's OK for us to hit a child, surely it's OK for the guard to give you a wallop when you're in the Garda station. But it's not. Give me a wallop. 
the point I'm trying to make, Orla, is if we were to make comparisons, if some if a guard was to give you a wallop in a guard station, you would uh, soon be in court uh, suing the state. But it's okay for us to slap kids. In some people's eyes, anyway. And one last message uh, on, what, on this whole conversation. I think a lot of parents are afraid of their own teenagers. I agree with you, actually, on that. Uh, and can't control them. I have three boys, and it's been a challenge at times. And without the backup and presence of their dad, I'm sure if they would have listened to me... I'm not sure if they would have listened to me alone when they uh, stepped out of line. And lots of messages on this, but I, I do think... Um, that parents should be held more uh, responsible for the behaviour of uh, their uh, teenagers. I really do. Anyway, thanks very much indeed for all of your calls, comments, texts and opinions. This is 98FM. 98FM's Dublin Talks. Call 6797981. And this is Adrian Kennedy with you until uh, midday today. We were having a conversation in our office earlier on, and in fact I brought uh, Jeremy in for this to... To remind us about this conversation, uh, how did this come up? Because we were asking you uh, about... Frivolous things. Uh, about yes. how, how you get time for the gym. I was asking you how you get time for the gym. And you said that a while ago, you actually came up with a magic solution which meant you didn't have to go to the gym as much. <laughs> this was a couple of years ago. Okay, we've all bought frivolous things. Um, you know, we've all impulse bought stuff. I'm sure if you all look around your house at the moment or in your bedroom, you will find an item that you spent money on and you thought it was a great idea at the time and you've never, ever got any use out of it. Like my wife, about a year ago, and I'll come to me in a moment, my wife decided to buy one of those things. Have you ever seen those? They're like tents, Adrian, that you put your drawing in. A tent to a put tent your drawing you put your in. Dry in. Yeah, they sell them in all these uh, in these fancy shops. And basically, what it means is, if you live in a house where you don't have a washing line, uh, you erect this tent in your house. You put your damp washing in it, and there's a fan underneath it, and it dries your clothing. It's like a a, a dryer that's made out of a tent. No, I didn't. No. Well, anyway, she bought it, used it once, and then threw it out. It ended up in the skip. But she reminded me of something I bought two years ago, and. I remember the day I was sitting at home one evening and I was watching one of the uh, one of the TV channels and an ad came on telling me that I could have fantastic abs. I could have a six pack. And the ad showed this lovely... What was it called? What was the thing called? It was an ab belt. Like an, an, ab, ab, belt. an ab belt. Right. And um, I remember seeing the ad and it shows this lovely muscular man with abs and he's like hey how you doing you can have abs like me in just six weeks if you buy this ad in fact, in fact I have the uh, the ad here when it comes to getting a strong that's him the midsection hard work pays off eventually but smart work pays too with system abs over 2 million people in over 30 countries have discovered the slender tone secret to tight, strong abs. Okay, so you basically... Uh, I was you, one of those 2 million right, okay. that, that discovered so, the secret. So do you basically put this belt around you and... So this is a belt that you... Suddenly you've got an 8-pack. Yeah, this is a belt you put around you and it sends it sends all these pulses up to you and then you end up looking like your your man there. So I bought it. I, as soon as I saw the ad, I was like, Sir, take my money. Take my money now. And I bought this ad belt. I can't remember how much it was. I think it was like 69 um, and I bought it and used it for about a month and I still had a gut on me after the month I looked nothing like him so you and bought it used it for a month and it's gathering dust ever since I haven't used it since I'll never use it again um, see the ad doesn't tell you Stop eating Tato crisps and cakes oh so you Why were won't... you were sitting there with the ad belt on with a packet of Tato in your hand Ah, right, okay. And, That's a pa- what and a packet of Mikado crisps as well. You you bought something Biscuits. as well, did you not? I did, yeah. Now, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sucker for Lidl and Aldi and their special offers, yeah? I'm okay. an absolute sucker for them. Oh, you're a middle aisle man, are you? I am, yeah. I love the middle aisle. I, I love oh. the middle aisle. And last year I was in um, one of them, I can't remember which one, it was Lidl or Aldi, and they were selling a chainsaw. And I thought to myself... So you were in buying Gouda cheese. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Gouda, by the way. Um, okay. I, I, so there I am in Lidl or Aldi, and there's a chainsaw. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, there is that tree that fell down uh, that really needs to be chopped up. I'll buy myself a chainsaw. So your garden's big enough that it has a tree. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But a, t- a rotten tree fell into our garden, okay? Okay. And I needed to chop it up to get rid of it. 
Okay. okay. To clear it away. Ever hear of a pickaxe? Uh, anyway, so uh, I saw the chainsaw and I thought, ha ha, there's my solution. So uh, 80 or 90 quid later, I walked out the door with a chainsaw and I brought it home and uh, I started it up as you do. Oh, it's a petrol one, is yeah, it? it is oh, one, I, yeah. Like yeah, I like yeah, them. I like them, yeah. And I, I duly went and I chopped up the tree. I chopped up the tree. There it is. Listen, listen. Here we go. Uh, uh, I have to say, lads and ladies, there's nothing that makes you feel more like a man than holding a chainsaw. Absolutely. It's, it's here, a we go, here we go, here we go. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah. Now, can now, I ask you a question? Okay, the, chains, uh, the chainsaw worked perfectly and I chopped up the tree. Okay, so you had wood, wood fire or whatever for, for a couple of weeks yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Uh, what's happened with the chainsaw since? Um, well, I only needed it for that one tree. <laughs> Do you want to swap it for an axe Ra- belt? Rather than borrowing a chainsaw of somebody, I went and bought one that I have no use for at all. And it's literally, it's, I'm sure it's working perfectly still, but it's literally sitting in the shed, hasn't been touched since. So that's what we're talking about. It's impulse buys. It's stuff that you've bought, stuff that you've seen on the telly or in a shop that you've gone, I have to have I, one of them. I just have to yep. have one of those. Um, like I'm sure there's loads of people now who two years ago bought a drone and haven't used it since. Yeah. Remember uh, two years ago, everybody was, oh, I need a drone. I remember someone, one of my neighbours saying to me, knocking on my door, he bought a drone. He says, Jeremy, you need a drone in your life. You cannot survive without a drone. Trust me, you need a drone. Did you buy one? No, I didn't. You resisted it. No. Okay, we want to hear from you, basically. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about um, what gimmick did you waste money on um, that you never use? So, okay, I used my chainsaw once. And it's sitting in the shed ever since. Literally. It has not been uh, seen the light of day since last summer. Not the summer just gone, but last year. Connie, I'm, right I'm now. Sorry, will you ever need to use it again? I don't think so. I have no need for a chainsaw. Unless another tree falls into our garden, but it's highly unlikely. And it's not as if you're going to go up the mountains before Christmas and cut down a Christmas tree no. and take it home, no, are you? No, I'm not. No. Call me right now on 6797 Text WhatsApp or send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 98, 98, 98. What gimmick did you waste money on um, that, for something that you've never, ever used? 98FM's Dublin Talks with QuoteDevil.ie Insurance specialists if you've opened claims or too many penalty points. 98FM Now, first off, um, you can stop sending messages in uh, offering me 30 quid, 50 quid, 60 quid for my chainsaw uh, because I now have family and friends saying wish I knew you had a chainsaw, I need to lend one. So um, I'm actually going to be lending it to somebody later on. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm a Lidl sucker, uh, says this message uh, from Dylan. He says, I got a plastic bag resealer and have never used it once. He, uh, there's another thing. I, I, I wasted money on a uh, laminator. And I find I use it maybe once a year. The odd time something comes up and I need to laminate. But then you get somebody like my dad. Uh, who bought the laminator and he laminates everything. He puts everything into laminate. Um, anyway, uh, we want to hear from you about stuff that you've wasted money on. Uh, what g- uh, gimmick did you waste money on uh, buying that you never, ever, ever used or used once like me with my chainsaw and never even had a need to use it again? I mean, uh, how much need is there for a chainsaw? Um, Michael bought something that he never used. About a year, year and a half ago, they re-released the PlayStation 1, like a, a mini version of it with built-in games. Yeah, I bought one of them. Still in the box. Rubbish. <laughs> I'd like to hear from you on 6797981. Text, WhatsApp, or send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 98, 98, 98. We're talking about things that you have spent money on, which was wasted money because you never, ever, ever used it. Or you used it like me with the chainsaw once because I only had one thing that I needed the chainsaw for and have no need for one ever since. Uh, Kevin, you're on 98 FM. Hi, Kevin. Morning, Adrian. Are you well? Tell me about um, your set of weights that you bought. <laughs> right, this is a bit embarrassing, but hey, what the hell? Uh, 18, bought a set of, bought an old weight, I bought a weights bench, bought the weights, the dumbbells, everything, right? Used for about a year. Got tired of it. For some reason, and I remember we had this conversation before, it's travelled around me uh, for the last two, 
30 odd years. I just, it's, it's just been gathering dust. And uh, I don't know, something made me kind of go, yeah. I, I always said I'd take it out again. Just never, yeah, tomorrow's your best friend. And yeah, about four or five months ago, took took them out and some things back into a routine with the old the old waist bench. So there you go. Right. So they sat so, they sat idle for years on end. Thirty years. Thirty uh, years. Hang on, bear with me, bear with me. Twenty plus years, twenty five plus years. Right. And, and yeah, I always said, look, yeah, yeah, yeah. But look, I'll get back into it. And something just clicked me one day. I said, gosh, look, it's going to be no pain, no gains. I'll, I'll give it a go and see what happens. And yeah, look back. So yeah, every second day I kind of... Okay, so never, do, 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 so do don't despair. Uh, uh, what you're really saying to me is the day will come where I'll actually need my chainsaw again. Yeah, basically, yeah. I'm, like, I, I'm as shocked as you are. Because it's like 20 plus years, it's just been, just been gathering dust. Now it was covered up, so like not literally, but uh, yeah, just something just came to me. So like, yeah, <laughs> I'll give it a go. Yeah, so yeah, there you go. It, the day will come. A neighbour might need it. A friend might need her. Family member might need okay, it. Okay, so so, so hang on to the chain. So, well, no, I've already agreed to lend it to a mate of mine there over, you go. over the weekend. Yeah, so. Whether you get it back now is a different thing. I'm not selling the chainsaw. Stop <laughs> ringing. Okay? The chainsaw is not for sale. Get your own. Uh, so hang on to it. Yeah, you okay, I'm, 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 I'm going to hang on to it. Sorry, our switch has been jammed with people offering money for the chainsaw. The chainsaw is now <laughs> off the market. It is not for sale. I'm being encouraged to hang on to it, that it will be uh, of value to me in the future. And I'm, I'm lending it to a mate of mine over this coming weekend. So I'm it's hanging on to it. Va- there you go. It already has value. You, 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 someone needs it for you. Yeah, okay, right. I'll, I'll hang on to it. Thanks, Kev. Not a problem. Bye bye. Six seven nine seven ninety eight one is our telephone number. We're talking about things that you wasted money on. An ad you saw on the telly and you went and bought it. Like I, I, I used to be an awful demon for, especially late at night. I'd come home late at night and I'd see an ad for some uh, new, uh, like eighties uh, box collection with like ten CDs, and I'd order it there and then. Uh, I'd actually have 90% of the music on it and I bought it for one song. I, I was a devil for it. I, re- I always did that. Um, Peter, what did you... Uh, Peter's on uh, a voice message. What did he w- uh, waste money on? Sorry, I can't come on, but about eight years ago, I bought an electric guitar. I don't know, I thought it was going to be Brian May or something. But anyway, it's sitting in the corner of the bedroom now, gathering dust. <laughs> Cheers, lads. I assume you could play the guitar, Peter, could you? Or maybe not. Or you thought buying a guitar, you'd, you'd automatically learn how to play it? Dave, what did you waste money on? A shotgun. A shotgun? Yeah. <laughs> right, now why did you want a shotgun? Because I wanted a shotgun. <laughs> uh, no, a friend of mine's dad was getting rid of this beautiful over-under shotgun. Right. Um, so I bought it off him. Then while I shot it a few times, left it in the, the gun cabinet at home. To just sitting there collecting dust. So in the amnesty a few years ago, I just brought it into the guard station and said, here you go. <laughs> what a waste of money. And did you get a license and everything for it? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, yeah, no, I have, I have a gun license, thank you. And... You know, but um, I kind of, the gun license was like, you know, I was like living down the country. I was like, yeah, all cultures have guns. It's going to be great crack. And <laughs> you get bored of it after a while, do you know? Like, I'm not into shooting rabbits, so kind of said a few pint glasses to heaven. That was about it. <laughs> what a waste of money. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. Plus, herself was on me and on me and on me to get rid of it because she wasn't, like, having a gun around the child. No, I don't, I don't blame her now, to be, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, so All I right. a compound bow instead. A what? You know, uh, you know the compound bow. You know a bow and arrow. <laughs> and you need a bow and arrow for what reason? Because they're fun. <laughs> And you'd probably use it twice? Uh, no, actually, that one we use all the time. We've target set up out the back, and my uncle's pretty good at it, so... Oh, right, okay. So, do you know, it's, it's it's slightly dangerous, but it's not as dangerous as a loaded gun, so... Fair enough. All right, good man. Thanks very much indeed. 67979081 is our telephone number. We're talking about things that you uh, wasted money on. An impulse buy, something that you didn't actually need, but ended up with anyhow. Um... Now, somebody texted in to say, this is back to my chainsaw. Get over the chainsaw. Uh, the chainsaw comes in handy. I was only using mine on Saturday. Also grand for ringing logs so you can chop them, uh, with, uh, so that you can chop them with an axe. Uh, so keep the chainsaw. And then another message is saying, your chainsaw won't be any good if it's not used regularly. 
says Joe in, uh, in Tala. Okay, Joe, when I get home today, uh, I will start it up and use it for 30 seconds. Robbie, what did you waste money on? I was 18 to be teenagers and I wanted to impress, so I bought the car for future. <laughs> if you didn't hear what he just said, he wanted to, you, you wanted to impress... Yeah. So at 18 years of age, you went and bought a copy of the... Karma Sutra. <laughs> oh, okay, t- tell our listeners, Robbie, uh, who may not know uh, what the Karma Sutra is. What is the Karma Sutra? It's a book all about the self authority thing, teaching me how to do different positions and spiritual this and spiritual that. Yeah. <laughs> well, the new post thing, trying to impress me teenagers because I was free flow. So, uh, so what, uh, were you trying to impress somebody in particular or was this going to be part of your chat up line? I know the Karma Sutra. No, I was just trying to impress not one person in particular, but <laughs> anyone, so, I, any, anyone I could impress. <laughs> That's brilliant. And uh, have you ever put anything you ever learned in the Karma Sutra into action? Uh, I don't think so. No, there you <laughs> I'll ask me missus when I go home. That's a great story. Thanks, Robbie. That's what he wasted money on. Stephanie wasted money and, um, on, on, well, on this. I bought two debutante dresses for no reason whatsoever. I had a wedding to go to, but this dress would have upstaged the bride, so I don't know why I bought two. I did use one to go back to Canada and surprise my grandmother at church, standing outside holding the door open for everybody. But other than that, yeah, 500 euros later, and it's sitting in my closet. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, let's squeeze in another couple. Uh, Joanna, you're on 98 FM. Hi, Joanna. Hi, yeah, good morning. Well, what was it that you wasted money on, that impulse buy that you didn't actually need? Well, I could have went a bit cheaper, I suppose. It was my wedding shoes. It was 10 years ago, and I wore them for a few hours during the ceremony, and then I, they were killing me, so I took them off, put them back in the box, and I haven't took them out since. And they cost me 150 quid. 150 I, quid to wear for a couple yeah, of hours? A couple of hours, because I hated, I loved the look of them, but I hated them when they were on me because they were just killing me. So I just took them off, put them in the box, forgot all about them. Actually, there, a it, it, there's, a, there's a conversation for another day. Uh, I was at an event on Saturday night, okay? And uh, everybody was all dressed up. So all the men were all dressed in their lovely suits and the ladies were all in their lovely dresses and their lovely shoes, OK? Mm-hmm. And it, it, I'm sure in some cases they spent a, a fair few bob on their shoes. Of course. But right. over half of the women, within an hour, maybe an hour and a half of the event starting, over half the women were wearing flip-flops. Yeah, yeah, What, what is that all about? Uh, and do you know, I was actually at a wedding there last year and the bride and groom, when you went into the ladies, they just had a bucket full of flip flops for the women to wear if they wanted to get out of their shoes. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah. I just don't get that. So you put all this effort into getting these lovely shoes to match this lovely dress that you and, have. And they are lovely. But and they, they are lovely. Me. And then within an hour of the event starting, you're wearing flip flops. One, one lady actually had her slippers with her. I should have went into pennies and got a pair for... 20 quid. Yeah, but this this particular woman the other night, this is true, uh, had a beautiful dress on, looked really well, until you looked at her feet and she had her slippers on. <laughs> anyway, that's a conversation for another day because I'm, I'm sure her original shoes were gorgeous. Anyway, thanks very much indeed, uh, Joanna. Uh, Fitzy sent me this WhatsApp voice note. Hi, Adrian. My ma, when Little's forced open, my ma used to be down there every Monday and Thursday for the special boy. And Jace is still stuff from the special boy 10 years ago, still sitting up in the attic. She's a hoarder. <laughs> and she buys all that shite. I'll give you your chainsaw, my chainsaw to your mother then, Fitzy. How about that? All right. Thanks very much indeed for all of your calls. Great calls there. This is 98FM. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks. Call 6797 And this is Adrian Kennedy with you until uh, midday today. Now, on Friday, directly, <coughs> excuse me, after our programme on Friday, at about 10 past 12, we got a message from one of our listeners uh, called Lucy. And Lucy is a non-drinker, but is fed up being judged because she doesn't touch a drop. Have a listen to this. This came into us on Friday. Um, guys, I had an experience today that I think could be an interesting discussion for the show. 
I was at a parent and toddler group and got chatting to some of the other mams. They were talking about Friday night and getting the kids to bed so that they could enjoy a few bottles of wine. They asked me what I'd be drinking tonight and I told them uh, probably a can of Fanta. They immediately asked, oh, are you pregnant? Which I'm not. So I told them I just don't drink. Straight away, I was asked why. You see, I used to drink, uh, but to cut a long story short, after an extremely difficult year, I turned into a sad drunk, so I decided not to drink anymore. They all looked at each other with weird looks and started to tell me that I was mad not to drink and I hadn't found the right drink yet and what did I do for fun if I don't go out drinking? This is quite a common reaction and to be honest, I'm pretty fed up with it. I don't judge anyone for enjoying drink, but I'm constantly judged myself for not drinking. I always get told, oh, I couldn't do that or the classic, you must be fun at parties. I still go to parties, I still go clubbing the odd time, and I still meet my friends for drinks. The only difference is, I'm having a non-alcoholic drink. When did it become not okay to not drink? Why do people think it's okay to question why I'm not drinking? And that's from a lady, uh, as I said, that was sent in to us on, on Friday, so she had obviously just come home from the the parent and, what was it, the parent and toddler group on uh, Friday, and was so annoyed by this that she sent that message. Call me right now on 67979081. If you're somebody who also doesn't drink, do you find yourself getting judged by people? Are you somebody who couldn't go out and enjoy yourself without having a drink? Call me now on 67979081. Text WhatsApp or send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877989898. FM's Dublin Talks with QuoteDevil.ie Car and van insurance specialists for drivers with previous motoring convictions. 98FM I don't know if you were listening closely to that advert there uh, just a moment ago from the RSA um, and basically what it's saying and this is for anybody listening to us who's driving here in Ireland on a British um, driver's licence. At the moment it's no problem to, uh, to drive here because they're European licences but after Brexit you won't be able to drive here anymore. And you'll have to literally start from scratch. So you could be driving years on an English licence and you'll have to start from scratch and go back and do your learner's permit and all that. So the point of the ad is if you were driving here in Ireland on a, a UK licence, trade it in before uh, the 31st of, December, of uh, October because after that you won't be able to. Okay? Be warned. Anyway, that's just listen to that ad. Now, uh, Lucy has touched on something here. She sent us a message uh, last Friday. She was at a group, um, a parent and toddler group, got chatting to the other women, and they were all looking forward to that night, and they were going to have a bottle of wine or two and look forward to that. And when she said um, that she would be having a bottle of Fanta, they all immediately looked at her and said, why? Um... And they all looked at each other with weird looks and started to tell me that I was mad not to drink and I hadn't found the right drink yet and what do I do for fun if I don't go out drinking and blah, 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 blah. And she's basically being judged for not being a drinker. And we had this conversation in the office earlier on and uh, one of my colleagues is a non-drinker and for years people have said, ah, it's okay, she, you just haven't found the right drink yet. Call me now on six seven nine seven ninety eight one. Finton, you're on ninety eight FM. How are you, Finton? That's a crack. How's it going there? Good, thank you. Now, Finton, <laughs> you don't drink at all. No, I don't like it. You don't like it. No. Now, a lot of people I... would say, Ash, you just haven't found the right drink yet. I have Coke. No. <laughs> and yeah, uh, Coke uh, ha have you found the same thing that people kind of? Oh, you don't drink. No, I don't like alcohol at all. No, but I'm asking you, do people ever oh, question you about it? They have, yeah, they have. Yeah, they, they said they begged me, they played with me, go have a few drinks with them. I just I just said to them, having drinks is like sitting on a carnival ride. You wake up, you, you get on normally, you end up with, a, with your head spinning. The next thing you know, you wake up next morning, you're dying sick. Oh, so you just don't see the point in it? Exactly, I don't. I tried it a few times, I said, I don't see the point in it at all. Right, so uh, this whole get, getting drunk thing just doesn't appeal to you at all, and you, ha and you have tried it? I have tried it, I have, and all you do is then make an arse yourself, what do you do? 
Yes, you probably do, all right. OK, so you just avoid it altogether. Um, and when was the last time you had a drink? No, I, just, I couldn't even... I couldn't even have last year. And does it bother you being around people who are drinking? No, it doesn't. Doesn't because, because you know when I'm sitting there with the with phone in hand ready, the video the video of them for YouTube, watching this but doing very stupid things so I can laugh at them. Okay, so yeah, but are you one of those people that is sneering at drunk people? No, not sneering, no, not at all, no, not at all. But I don't you're... know, no, 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 like, I like having a laugh and a joke and I, I love that, you know, but so are you, are you, if you're out with people and they're all mm. drinking or getting drunk, are you yeah. able to have have the crack with them? Oh, got... Of course I am, yeah. Jesus, of course I am. Jesus, it's not. It's what, I, I, don't, I don't like being around people who are uh, cause people when they're drunk. I hate that, I do. I, I like people who are like, happy drunks. I like them, I do. I don't mind them. They're, like, um, they're fun to be around. Like, you can have a laugh with them. But not aggressive drunks. Oh, jeez. Oh, no. No way. They get bottles thrown at you. Everything from them. Yeah, they're yeah. psychos. All right, stay there for one second. Um, Greta, you're on 98 FM. Hiya, Greta. Hello. Now, you heard the message from uh, Lucy, who was questioned, was quizzed on Friday about why she doesn't drink. Uh, You've actually been excluded from some social events because your husband's a non-drinker. We, we, I be, I have, I'm a grandchild, so we're older than the the lady you're talking to. But, so all our lives, um, we were we would have been moderate drinkers. Okay. And when it came to our wedding, people didn't come to our wedding because we didn't drink. We, we would take a drink. But because we wouldn't drink any substantial amount or it wasn't significant to us, mm-hmm. people will not mix in our company because there's no use going with them um, because we don't drink, we're perceived as a pair of dry shites. I was about to say that. Is that, is that what they yeah. look at you as? A pair yeah. of dry yeah. shites? They're, they're no fun. And then kind of later on then, as in, in work, if there's a party on in work, why would you invite her? She'll, she'll sit with one drink all night long, which is exactly what I will do. But I don't want to drink anymore. And so people are jumping to the conclusion that because you don't drink, or you might have one, because yeah. you don't drink, that makes you boring company. Um, I'm not too sure whether they're interested in our company. I think it might mean that we can't finance a round. I'm not quite sure what it means. But we're, we're certainly not. We would be excluded because we don't drink. And then any. any and as a matter event, of interest, like if you are in company, do you get into rounds with people? No, I, I, I no, I would avoid not to because I think it's an embarrassment because I'm only having one or two. I want to control how much I'm drinking. I at the, when I was younger, I was going home to young children. Mm. One of us had to be, my husband's uh, livelihood was driving, so he couldn't drink. And if the child was sick when I went home, the child was sick on one occasion when I went home. So I'm going home in a fit state so that I can mind my children. And that's, that's fine, and, and that's your decision, and um, yeah. that's very responsible of you and all of that, right? But yeah. you have found that people automatically assume that because you don't drink, that makes you socially inferior, basically? Um, we're perceived as being mean and we're perceived as being non-fun. And then, don't bother, if they're invited to our house, we wouldn't necessarily have drinks at the house because they have to drive. The people have to drive home. Mm. And if it's, a, if it's a children's event, we would never have alcohol at christenings or children's birthday parties wouldn't occur to me. Communion, confirmation, alcohol, why? The child can't drink, it's the child's day. Why are we having alcohol if the child can't have it? Yeah, I'm not going to argue with any of that. Um, and But people, because you felt so strongly about... Uh, it's, it's not that we felt strongly about it, that's just what we did. Okay, no, yeah, okay. And therefore our circle of friends would be very, very small. For that reason? Yeah. So you've become social outcasts, basically. Yeah, yeah. Don't because you don't drink. Them. Yeah. Wow, that's kind of bizarre, to be honest with you. Mm. And do you not have other friends who don't drink? We do, so we socialise with them. Ah, right. So, okay. when, so when our children, when there were children's events, we each went to each other's gardens. And, and, and we eventually we just got around, we would call it a tea party. It didn't occur to us. It didn't occur to us that we didn't offer anybody a drink when they came for the child's communion or confirmation. 
because it was the child's day and it didn't occur to us to have alcohol in the first place. But it did occur to the others who were yeah, invited. But, yeah, but we only realised that half an hour before they were leaving. Ah, right. OK, stay there for one second, Greta. So basically social outcasts because they don't uh, drink. Um, Dave, you're on 98FM. How are you, Dave? Oh, yeah, how are you doing? No, uh, Dave. Um, you're off the drink for two years. Yeah. I Sorry, I can't hear you, Dave. You'd have to talk into that phone properly. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, now? that's much better, yep. Well, it was in rehab for two years, Dave, then, and um, when I was in rehab, we used to go to the set for, but I'm not going to mention no names, no this, no that. And my friends used Sorry, to... Sorry, uh, Dave, it's really difficult to hear you. I don't know what you're doing with that phone. Can you hear me now? Yes, Sorry. keep it just like that. Don't move it. Okay, and... Uh, I go into the pub every day and I drink black cod and squash. And my friend said to me, keep going to the same pub you end up getting a haircut. And what happened there, Dwayne? After two years, I ended up getting a haircut and I started drinking. And my life hasn't been the same since. I lost my dear friend. I lost my family. And I lost my dog and I lost everything. Because of drink. I drink. drink. Because of drink, baby. I nearly lost my home. Because, because of drink. Oh, you still so well. You know, I was getting a day of work, like here and there, and I just had a slip, and I lost everything because of drink. And drink is the course. And people say, well, I can handle this, I can handle that. I thought I could do a drink, and I was on the streets for 20 years, and I was drinking day in and day out. When I went into rehab, my life changed. The minute I left rehab, I started going to AA. I had a slip. I'm, I'm back to square one again. And don't let people out there. And how, how, how do you find not drinking now? Oh, I'm actually drinking at the moment, I think, because I lost everything. Oh, so I thought, it says on my screen here you've been no, off the drink for two years. No, I, I was off for two years. Right. I was going to AA, but I had a slip. And I lost everything. All because of I had one kind of cider and everything just changed. I was off for two years, I was in rehab, and I was going to AA, and all of a sudden, I kept going to the same pub, and I said, one day, I won't course, slip it, I'll have a pint of cider, and that was it. It just ripped me all, it, it ripped me apart, I lost my family, my girlfriend, my dog, the whole, I lost everything, all because of drink. And people think out there that, oh, well, I can have one or two and go home and everything be all right. I can't, Adrian. You can't, yeah. I can't. I, I, I wait for one. I'd have to have a day with seven or eight. And then get a few cans coming home then. And, to and are you honest, going to go back to AA? I am going back to AA, yeah. I oh, am. Yeah. I, I still... Don't get me wrong, Adrian. I still go to AA, drink or no drink. And they praise me. They praise me for coming back. I have few numbers, you know. I can get in contact with people. I got a cup of, a cup of tea... They're asking the hand to go through the book because they only got to step three. And step three is that you have to learn and listen to what people say to you. Of course, I didn't, I mean, I just kept drinking all the time. You know, and at the end of the day, you know, like, when you're drinking, people don't want to know you, Adrian. When you're out in the streets, I mean, I got my own place after 20 years. Well, mind you, uh, listening to other callers there, Dave, we've been hearing that if you don't drink, like uh, Greta's story, uh, if you don't drink, you become a social pariah. Grania, um, is a, you're a very moderate drinker. I am. And you don't understand the pressure that people put on you to actually drink. Well, it's, I don't understand why it's the only addictive substance. I mean, it's under drugs and alcohol, um, when you hear about it, mm-hmm. and it's the only addictive substance that you have to justify or be questioned for not using. And, and, it, and it is a bizarre thing. My my own wife um, has cut down drinking, um, and she finds herself when, when when we're out somewhere ordering what looks like a fake drink, so that nobody will ask her to have a drink. <laughs> so she'd order a drink in a gin and tonic class that looks like a gin and yeah. tonic, but it's not a gin yeah. and tonic. And right. People won't question her because it's in a gin and tonic class, which is bizarre. But uh, so you find that people, you know, do question you or do query why you're not having an alcoholic drink. Yeah. And I think and I really, truly believe it is they push drink on others to feel better about themselves and their own drinking habits. So which may be an issue, but they want to have another drink and 
Um, and I don't think it's I don't think it's a case of being like, oh, let me get you a drink. And I think it's played off like that. But I don't think it's actually a case of that. It's like, I want to have another drink. Oh, awkward. I will feel awkward if you don't have another drink. So I really need you to have another drink so I can have my drink and feel comfortable with myself. I think people, I think they generally, yeah, I think they generally come from... So is it a case, though, uh, Grania, that generally speaking, obviously this doesn't apply to everybody, but generally speaking, when you hear of somebody like that lady, I mean, that call a couple of minutes ago, describing how people uh, didn't even want to go to their house anymore because you wouldn't be offered a drink. Is it that, have, is it that we I see have, people as non-drinkers uh, as, as boring? Um, do we find them boring? No, I have a... No, I'm saying in it. general, is that what people look at non-drinkers as? Boring people? Well, I think, in, I think in Ireland particularly, I think we have a mental health issue. I think people go out, they have a lot of anxiety, there are a lot of... St- social anxiety and I think they have a few drinks they feel better equipped unfortunately to maybe be more social maybe to let their guards down so drink is used as a self-medicating um process here I think that um I don't think that I have a better chance of being more social. I'd have a better chance of getting up and dancing on a table sober than I would drunk. I don't right. need the alcohol to do something like that. And maybe uh, yeah, maybe um, that's part of the problem that us Irish have that we feel we can't uh, enjoy ourselves without it. Jason, you haven't touched a drop in eleven years. Yeah, well, I was actually thinking it's twelve years. Twelve years, and, twelve years. and and people still to this day question why you don't drink. Oh, yeah, yeah, some people, especially like people that knew me when I was drinking, you know. Now, and in fact, there's something, um, I've all, uh, and it's something that sticks in my head. If you know somebody who doesn't drink, yeah, but used to drink, most people think that they now don't drink because they had a problem. Yeah, well, I kind of did, you know. <laughs> oh, right, OK. So that, 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 that's a reasonable <laughs> assumption in your case. But it's not today. always the case. Some people just decide to give up drinking. Oh, yeah. But like, I, had a, I had a reason to give up. You know, it's, I did stupid things when I was drunk. Right. For this way, I can still remember the, day, the date of my last drink. The 24th of June 2007. Because of what happened that particular day? Yeah. Right, well, OK. Well, I was scared as well to remind me. OK. So... What sorts of things do people say to you? Oh, well, it's just like, when you need new people, you can't understand why you don't drink. It's the only drug I have to explain that we don't take. But yeah, and in fact, drugs, and that's the point Grania was making. We'd never yeah. query anybody, you know, do you do cocaine? Uh, yeah, or would you like uh, to do yeah, cocaine? Like well, you know, but when it comes to drink, yeah, to you're right. The only drug I have to explain why I don't use it. Mm. <laughs> but... Now, I have to say, some people that knew me when I was drinking, if they are there and other people question me about it, they would say, no, shut up, leave him alone. He's better off not drinking. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right, OK, because that's people who remember you from back then. Fair enough. Um, Adrian, uh, I'm nearly 48 and never liked drink. Tried drinking at 18 and never really liked it. But every time you go out, it is crazy the amount of people uh, that say to you, oh, you don't drink. And uh, you have to keep repeating yourself. And another thing the pubs are doing is selling the 200 ml bottles of Coca Cola and charge the same price as a 330 ml uh, bottle of Coca Cola, says uh, Noel. Um, we are an Indian couple. We don't drink. I am judged, but my husband, but husband used to buy a drink and leave it on the table so nobody judges him. So he actually went and bought, what, he'd buy a pint and just leave it sitting on the table so that people would think he actually was drinking it. Uh, my husband uh, hasn't had a drink in five years and he gets called a dry shite. Um, this is a huge problem, actually. Uh, I don't drink uh, as I don't like it. And as well, it causes so much heartache. My son drank, but now he is two years off the drink. So now we go and watch the soccer in a pub and have a glass of Coke each. Happy days. So it causes, um, it causes no problems at all. Um, uh, yeah, in fact, as a, as a kind of a follow-on conversation, maybe later on during the week, you just heard that man, and I'm sorry we, we rushed his call because uh, I just wanted to squeeze in another couple of calls on that conversation, but maybe tomorrow or the next day we might have a focus on how alcohol has destroyed lives. That it actually should become a cool thing to say, oh, well done, you don't drink. What's up, me right now? If you if you want, if you've a story that you'd like to share with us about how alcohol has destroyed your life or your family's life or whatever, 
Uh, text, uh, WhatsApp us right now on 0877 98, 98, 98. I'm really sorry to have to rush that. We're way out of time for today. Back with you again tomorrow morning at 10am. Andy Clark is on the way in for Barry Dunn. And in the next hour, he's got some great music lined up like these. <laughs> Let me love you. Let me be the one. 98FM's Dublin Talks. With QuoteDevil.ie. Car and van insurance specialists for difficult to insure cases. 98FM.